Well, I, I use the term operational methodology to, mm-hmm. to describe, you know, what I, I, I um, refer to as four seminal methodologies. And those four seminal methodologies that I describe as unistructures, harmelotics, triaxium theory, which is Anthony Braxton's sort of part of his theory. He has a much bigger thing, volume, you know, thousands of pages. Try but, to read those books, man, and it's pretty dense. Yeah, but but certain things happen in those three. And then what I call very broadly European free improvisation. You know, those are ways that people operate based on somebody's idea. In the first three, there's a, a composer kind of director of it. Um uh, instigator, you know, organizer, engineer. And then the last one, and that impacts a collective group of people, a community of people. And then the last one is a community of people who've collectively done that. And, and, um, they all engage in some kind of methodology so that while the unknown is presenting itself to them, what I would call contingencies, you know, things happen and you have to make a decision. They're prepared to make decisions uh, as they confront those things based on a certain mode of practice that they that they they're aware of mm-hmm. and and that they're able to um uh consistently reproduce uh and consistently expand upon and um you know I think part of the problem with with people in their understanding of this is that they're not willing to change the way they un- they they try to understand it it has to be based on harmony or it has to be based on philosophy or it has to be based on something other than what it is. Yeah. And if you think about it as methodology, well, there's lots of methodology around us that we can compare it to. There's lots of methodology and technology that we can compare it to. There's lots of very deliberate things going on there that um, create a, a, a uniformity in the, in, in, in the design and the engineering and the, and the results. And we just need to have another way of, talking about it and another way of looking at it so that we can comprehend it. And, um, you know, maybe that'll happen. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you're playing, let's say you, you go in and you're playing, you're doing a performance with any group of people. Do you think in advance what is going to be the methodology in this? Or do you just go into it with your own intuition, your background, your influences, whatever's made you who you are, assuming that everybody else is going to have the same idea? Like, do you look at these things sort of in that from that viewpoint? Well, you know how it is that you you pretty much know who you're going to play with, right? Yeah. And you know what they do? Right. Well, I would say that um, if, for instance, I just worked with a group of people that I would associate with one particular way of improvising, the, and a lot of times in these, well, in these communities of improvisers, people have a kind of uh, a way of talking like, this is the music, this is it. This is, well, you know, that's a way of defining what they do. And then you listen to what they do or you hear them or you talk to them. You can get an idea of what they're doing. I'm I cross into lots of different communities of people because that's I, I have I try to be as nonlinear about this as I can, and um, I want to know I want to be as versatile as I can, and mm-hmm. I want to have as many opportunities to play that that demand things of me as I can get. So I, I'm in a lot of different groups of people, and I've learned to read what's happening based on how I identify what's happening. You know, mm-hmm. and so I. Um, partly I would go on the idea that is, has began, I would say in jazz and was differently sort of, uh, presented and exemplified in, in European free improvisation in the sort of ad hoc thing that Derek Bailey and Evan Parker and those guys did, Mm -hmm. which is to say, well, everybody who comes is a kind of orchestration. Everybody's an orchestra. And so each individual person has certain things that they do. And each individual person has to contend with one another. And so the way they interact is very important. The Mm -hmm. way they express the pulse is very important. The way they use pitches or sounds or the way they process melodic ideas, all those things are very important. So in my way of playing, sort of like trying to figure out what how, you know, what tempo people are playing. Are they doing a Latin version of all the things you are? <laughs> or are they doing, you know, the the Arch, the uh, Artie Shaw version? Yeah. Are they doing the bebop version? Or, you know, they doing the Jim Hall version of uh, Darn That Dream? Or are they doing the, uh, the um, uh, uh, I can't think of the guy I was going to, West Montgomery version. Mm-hmm. He didn't do that, but um, maybe sure. he did. Maybe um, he did. You know, are they doing that version or are they doing something else? You have to read the signals as they come to you. The way I do it is I listen to, you know, much more meta property kinds of things like the pulse. Mm-hmm. I listen to how they interact. I listen to 
how what I would say, what's the scheme in what they do? Is it a is it a long scheme? Is it a short scheme? Are they interacting in juxtaposition to one another? Are the materials allowing that? Um, is, are there sounds like unvoiced sounds, or are they pitch sounds? Are they playing in phrases? Are they playing in in uh, uh, you know kind of riffs? You know what are they doing that's going on? And I I analyze all that stuff as quickly as I can and try to. Uh, immerse myself in that kind of mode of practice and at the same time try to put something else there that will, um, you know, contribute something. But I do find that because I think of it like that, it's difficult for me to walk into a situation and have people change what they're doing for me. Like that almost never happens. Okay. <laughs> it never happens. I can configure groups of people and rehearse with people and they can learn how I like to do it, which is based on these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's kind of a composite of all of those things. Sure. And so people have to know all of those things to very comfortably play with me so we can just improvise or maybe we use a composition and we improvise. And I've had various uh, versions of that going on in it's, that's you know well represented in, in my discography, uh, which is now sure. 150 records and growing. Yeah, I was going to ask you about growing. that. That's yeah, a and lot and um, you know, so I I haven't repeated myself because I can take the overall sort of design of all these kinds of things and have that be the music. Right. And uh, you know, it's different if I play with, you know, I've been lucky. I got to record duos with Anthony Braxton and also with Evan Parker. Mm. And they're very different. You sure. Know? And I wouldn't say that I've given up anything. <laughs> I just read what they're doing. Now, when you play with Braxton, he's doing the same thing. Braxton is like, is like a processor. <laughs> I mean, he is unlimited in what he will do and what he wants. He has is totally open to what's going on. Uh, partly because he's so organized and he's such a nonlinear thinker. Yeah. Evan's awesome as well, but Evan, ha Evan has a very deliberate kind of thing he does. So there's a lot of flexibility within that, but it doesn't change. And so sure. you're going to get Evan Parker on a, on a good day or Evan Parker on a bad day, and you're going to have to find a way to contend with that. Um, and so the idea to be able to improvise and have a variety of results based on who you play with or uh, what I'm trying to do now is play with a lot of the same people and have a lot of variety of results, which is something I did before earlier in my, um, I guess you call it a career sure. <laughs> earlier decades ago where I wrote different kinds of pieces to create a different kind of template for us to work in. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I kind of read what's there. I, I read the properties of free music. I, I read what properties are in play. Sure. So when I talk about the properties of free music, I mean it in a practical way. Like, here's how we're going to play kind of way. It's not like a phil philosophical right, thing. Of course, it's yeah. like saying, here's the changes. Yeah. Here's the changes. You know, here, here's, here's how we navigate, you know, over a 251. It's the same kind of thing, except that's what you do now to be able to play. This gives, it gives you a, a good understanding of how to read what's going on. And you were in my ensemble, so you remember me saying, now listen to how the drums are accenting the pulse here. Yeah. If you play along with the drums, you'll be more harmonic because harmonics is about the drums. Right. So as unit structures in a different kind of way. So sure. I try to get everybody to have a very practical, like mus musical uh, technique based understanding of what free improvisation is. So yeah. they base it on how everyone's playing. Sure. And yeah. not anything bigger than that. Yeah.